Good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I have to say to be here again. Um, I had the honor to speak also at the Business of Design Week when Italy was the guest country. Because as um, was introduced, I worked in uh, Pininfarina, one of the main uh, design companies in Italy. But I have to say, um, it's even more pleasurable to be here uh, when Belgium is uh, the partner country, because I am Belgium, uh, Belgian, I grew up in Flanders, and uh, this is the neighborhood, the context I grew up with. This is actually the atelier of my grandfather, I come from an artist family, also my father, my brother, they're all artists, but I was kind of the, uh, the technical guy in the family, in the after hours, I was always working on small technical stuff. And since very young, I had this fascination with uh, vehicles, objects that move you. And uh, this led that in a very early age, I was you know, a typical guy restoring cars, working on them. And this is relevant to me because in a way, I think it's, I did this before I learned design. I did this actually before I knew there was even a profession like design. And I think it influenced me in the sense that I've always seen since then objects that it's inside and outside as one thing together. I've never approached an object as just an aesthetic around it and then filling in later on. Actually, I worked three years on an old car and only at the end the appearance of the object came there. And it stands a bit as a metaphor for the way I work. Inside out, building it up, seeing the external shape as a communication of what is, what is within, what it stands for. And after my studies at the University of Delft in Holland, I had the uh, opportunity and also pleasure to be able to start to work in Pinifarina. I started as an intern, actually, in 98. And upon my arrival, uh, in a way, I immediately got a kind of second design lesson, because this is the view you get when you step inside the entrance of Pininfarina. And one might think like, wow, well, cool, a swimming pool. Actually, it's, of course, it's not a swimming pool. It's just a water basin for the spray system, uh, for the fire system. So it's a lesson in aesthetics, function, combined. It's what Pininfarina stands for, and it was is something, of course, that heavily influenced me in my development. I worked there on several projects, of course. I grew as junior designer, senior designer, chief designer, and so forth. Working on small city cars, this was a concept, Nido, from 2004, with a very safety system inside, something I'm still proud of. It was the first concept introducing the iPods at the time to use in your car. So no longer build everything into your car, but just start using all those personal devices we carry with us, something that I think will become very strong in the near future in cars. And after a more structural, process-driven approach almost in Holland, in Italy I also picked up the love for the shape, the physical shape, the working on it, the touching it, and also always acknowledging that it's in the finesse of the shape also that a depth of a project can be expressed. And that's something I think quite typical for the work I do. A lot of finesse in the, uh, in the end. I like sophistication. I like honesty in the shape. And it became part of me and a part of my working. And of course, it's only a luck, I think, if, as young designers you can work with, at my time, people like Sergio Pinifarina and Andrea Pinifarina. And from them, I picked up a lot. And the car you, we stand here for, at the time, I became chief designer. It was the first project I was leading as chief designer was the Maserati Birdcage. Uh, a concept car, a show car, a dream car. It was a car to celebrate 75 years of Maserati and um, also a car to uh, show that we should also dream sometimes. A car business is very much linked to reality, very much linked to constraints, to legal constraints, but it's important to dream. I'll get back to that later. 
maybe a small anecdote. In the middle when we presented this car, um, you know, you go to the motor show and those projects are really kind of rush project. This was from sketch to the final uh, object you see here in like five and a half months. And when we arrived at the motor show, uh, the car opens with a big canopy at the top with a remote control. Just a bit like today, a lot of uh, technical equipment, a lot of interference, the car didn't work anymore. So we had to improvise how we did it for the press conference last minute. So what we did is just, we put it, the girl that normally stands next to the car, we put her inside. And I still remember the moment when I was taking away the drape, she was already sitting in the car for, I think, a good half an hour under the hot lights. And we pulled away the, the drape. I was seeing her kind of red inside, but I wanted to wait to make sure we got all the pictures right and then only later on opening up the car. And finally, she was relieved because, of course, in five months and a half, you don't build in air conditioning. But it's not only dreaming, it's also trying to design consciously, trying to help to generate solutions for the future. This was a project uh, electrical car, the B0. Um, small electrical car, batteries in the bottom. This was about five years ago when the whole electrical car uh, trend almost uh, started off. And design companies in Italy also work a lot, that's known lesser, for Chinese companies. This is uh, a work we did for uh, JAC, a Chinese manufacturer. And actually we did several cars. And as you see, those cars are more uh, uh, constrained, more regular, more meant for the mass market. But I believe that in the future, a lot will be happening in the interiors of the car. That's where we will see, really see the revolution going on. And uh, I touched upon that a couple of times with the concept cars, as you have seen in the needle before, also in the Synthesi, which was uh, again a concept car. And somehow, in all those 10 years, I noticed, and you also noticed in the introduction, it's the red cars that stick the most. It's cars like this, the um, Alfa Romeo Duet Otanta. And of course then, as was mentioned, the Ferraris. Ferrari is such a big name, as soon as you're involved, it sticks and it connects. And I can only be proud of that. But to me, it starts to be really interesting when we look at this object, also at it being more than a Ferrari, beyond a Ferrari. Because that's when then you really start to touch what design is about for me. If you look really at what it is, then it's an object that is designed with an extreme focus on performance. So a lot of you maybe think, and a lot of people in the general public think that these are really styling objects. But in a way, a Ferrari is almost less styled than a regular car, because when you work on it, you work in such a close contact with engineers, and all the focus is also on that performance to get the aerodynamics right, to make sure the engine is cooling. So if you see all those gaps and holes, they are flashy, they can be beautiful, but they're also necessary. Without those holes, the car will overheat. The car uh, won't run after a, a certain period of time. And that is also where, for me, the value lies in working on these type of projects. It's working in a context, in a condition, where an extreme performance is required. So it's pushing you in terms of the materials you use, the turn in how you optimize the shape, how light you make the structure. It's really pushing you to get the maximum out of that. And that is a universal value to me that you can also, and that we also apply when you work on a small city car. So it's that type of performance that is interesting to me. And that's the first part for me of the title of this lecture, Performance Design. So every design is and it's definitely a car, somehow needs to accomplish an action, a function. In cars, that's very strong. I touched upon the efficiency, 
We also work in a context which is extremely cost competitive. So you need to be extremely performing from that point of view. And of course, functionality inside, ergonomics and so forth. But that is of course only a small part of the story because it's not just about function. We're far beyond form follows function. It's also, design is also about the bodily act of performing. Every design for me is an act of performance. Every object is performing within the context, within society, in front of people, it's communicating with you. Because it is, of course, so much also about the communication. The styling we give to me is needed to communicate to you the potential it can have, what it can give to you. But then, of course, the real value of the design lies in the fact if it lives up to that promise, if it's just a promise and it allows you to approach the design, but then after you have a bad experience using it or being with it, then that's not good, of course. That would be superficial. The real value then lies in attracting through that promise, through the appearance, but then fulfilling in the interaction, in the use with the object. And that's also where I make a bit of division when I talk about beauty. For me, aesthetic beauty, which is very important to me, lies in that promise. And the intrinsic beauty lies in the fulfillment of that interaction. And it's a bit around that idea of the performance design that we also originated the new studio. So Grand Studio in, uh, in Turin, Grand Torino, that's where the name comes from. And uh, it allows for me to, uh, to work in a broader context. And the projects we do always follow that same philosophy. Here you can see also one of the projects we have been doing. Of course, we only exist three years, so cars takes three years to design. So from next year on, you will see a lot of things coming. But all the designs we do follow that. You see attention to shape, but for those who know, we also see a lot of aerodynamic elements. The shapes are very aerodynamic, efficient, they perform well. But at the same time, there's the act of performance. This was a project for a Chinese client. This is a car will come out. And uh, this was also to establish the brand, to communicate a new proudness, a confidence also, to come to the market with products that will really be up there uh, with top level, international point of view. The studio is now growing. We're about 20 people doing full design development from the early sketches all the way to the full end. And a project like this, for example, we developed, we finished it uh, last year for full production. So this was presented a couple of years ago at the Motor Show, but will be more production ready in a couple of years. And again, always this attention to detail. Detail are not the goal of design, but I think they're the starting point of that communication. Funny enough, maybe you work three years on a car design. If you quickly show it to a person and you ask what they remember, often it's the color. It's often the details that are picked up uh, the, the earliest. So in the detail already, you need to communicate what you stand for, what the design stands for, what it will give. But I talked now, until now, quite limited to the object of car. And the real mission for me with the studio is go beyond that. Because when we talk about performance, when we talk about that fulfillment, of course we need to talk about doing that in the future context. Cars take three years to design, so already, if I make a sketch today, for sure, it will only be used in three, four, five years from now. So we always need to work in the future. The future needs to be our mental frame of reference. And it's in that context that our performance needs to be successful, needs to be fulfilling. And when we take that context as reference, that also allows us to go beyond the object. And that is the mission. And the other day, I, in Turin, where I live, I walked in the street. It was a funny experience. They were redoing the streets. 
And normally this street is always full with cars on both sides. And it's a bit this, this metaphor. When talking about cars in cities, we all recognize the problems, pollution, congestion, taking away quality from our urban environment. And so these kind of experiences are interesting because very quickly in the evening, things happen, the streets are empty. And this is what we want to do when we design, I would not say cars, but vehicle, means to move people, to be mobile. In doing a project, I took in the briefing this painting, a famous painting from a Flemish painter, Bruegel. And I took this painting because it's in a time before technology arrived, before cars arrived. We see no cables, no traffic lights, not even signs on the floor. It's in a moment where only human activity was there in the city. And of course, this painting is especially on playing in the urban environment. And the project we're working on in the studio is saying, let's take that as starting point. So let's not start from a car and see how we can design it better. No, let's go back to before all the technologies were there that we now got so used of and try to imagine how should we do vehicles that are right for that type of context, vehicles that adapt to the human activity, not the other way around, as we have become very accustomed to. And that's the project Publipod that we're working on in the studio. So from that spirit, take this city. Don't take the street, don't take the car, don't take the existing traffic. Take the city with the people and try to imagine how we can mix with that. Try to infiltrate almost and not impose. And above all, start from what we want people to do, how they want to move. And only after that, go to the object, what the object should be. We work this out in scenarios also, what people should not do, misbehavior. How can we, with design, avoid certain misbehaviors? And that's how the project grow, sort of quietly, almost subtly, moving it in. So you saw the first sketch is transparent, almost not wanting to really put something in there, and growing and putting it in environments with that sort of request respect. Of course, Venice as an extreme, almost a cliche image, but still, you, you cannot impose an environment like that. You need transparency, you need a certain calmness, you don't need to impose. But the clue of this project is not the styling, absolutely not. It's about going further. As you can see here on the panel on the car, it's actually a screen. And because when we talk about mobility, it's not so difficult to design a cool object or a cool vehicle or a cool car. The big difficulty is how do we realize it? How do we resolve the chicken and egg problem? Do we first develop vehicles and put them in the city? Or do we first do an infrastructure and then later on make vehicles for that infrastructure? That, I think, is one of the real questions when we work on mobility. And that's why, as an integral part of this project, we integrate it in a way it's almost based around how a business model could work. And in this case, it's sort of taking almost literally the business model of a Google that offers service thanks to their advertisement and bring it back into the physical world. So take also digital systems, a digital way of thinking as a source of inspiration. So it's also here publicity that would help to pay for a public transport, which then would become very affordable. And it opens up a whole area, of course, of possibilities. It can be uh, almost literally disappear, being an um, advertisement that picks up from the shop that it stands in front of. It can show what events are going on. It can be for a group of friends meeting and watch a soccer game next year in Brazil. Or used for public announcements to show if a metro station is closed or a girl just using her dancing passes while the mother is waiting. 
So it's about the using. It's not so much only about the physical object. It's about how we can design a system that has multiple facets that all of them bring them together can work, can be something, can uh, be realized and actually change something and not just be on paper. So it is of course an object and we are experts in designing vehicles so we know how to do them. A lot of considerations went into this vehicle making it fully symmetrical so we cut the stamping cost by half. Uh, electrical engines are fully symmetrical to reduce the maintenance cost. But it's not the core. It's like our smartphone. It's not so much anymore about the physical appearance of it. That is the platform. It's the base to do something on, to do different possibilities that we showed before. And of course, integrate it with our mobile devices. We all know Uber. We all know the new possibilities be giving there. So that is part of the new studio to also design beyond the object, but, and that's for sure also maybe an influence that I got from being in Italy, but never neglecting for me the value also of the physical appearance. If there's a physical object, then let's do it good, let's make it beautiful, because there's a value in that. But start from the context. Don't start from the object. Let the object be, I would not say a consequence, it sounds too rational, but let it intuitively grow from what kind of context we want to create and what kind of performance we want to reach in that context. And quickly going back to my street, of course, the street didn't fill up with projects like that. Actually, the contrary happened. We started making the infrastructure even around the object. As you can see, the car was parked. They painted after, so the sign stays there. Going into step further, I would like to zoom out even further from cars, so from cars to mobility, but let's zoom out. What is for me really the process, the approach to design, and ultimately the true value of design for me? I get a bit technical, I put some graphics. If we imagine that the horizontal axis is kind of time development through a project, and the vertical axis is kind of at the bottom, the logic, the reality we know, the reality we, we feel sure for, and on the top is what we don't know yet, the dream, what is today maybe not possible yet, and each one of us will have a kind of line. What is possible, what is not possible. It will be different for uh, all of us. And most likely, for most of us, that line will be a bit below what is actually possible. That's the same thing for companies too. Companies also have in their process, in their organization, a kind of uh, reference of what is possible, what is not possible. But the only limit I'm really interested in, because I think there is a limit, but the only limit that I'm interested in is what is possible to do while respecting the forces of nature, the physical forces. I'm not interested in doing Hollywood design. I think that's a different type of profession than what I do. But I am very interested in breaking beyond what we can do today, but not really neglecting what nature allows us to do. There's no value in denying the force of gravity. There's no value in denying aerodynamics when you design a high-speed object. But all too often, when projects are designed, and I speak here mainly, of course, out of my experience of doing design projects in rather big organizations, one will work towards that limit. And in a car project, hundreds of people work on the project. Every engineer, of course, not every, but most of them will take a small margin of safety because you don't want that it's your piece that is breaking when they do the crash test. And in that way, often you end up close, but often slightly below what is possible, even sometimes slightly below what your 
own organization could do. What I prefer is out of that view of what you want the future context to be. So the importance is that you have a vision. You know where you want to go to. You know what should be reached. And out of that vision, allow yourself to jump. Sometimes even jump on top of the top uh, limits. Don't restrain yourself. Just dream and express with full force where you want to go. And of course, in these organizations, in big projects, that creates a creative tension. There's discussing, there's yelling, there's uh, all kind of things going on because, oh, those designers are coming again with sketches and we can't do it. I think a lot of designers will feel familiar with that. And design management, because as a design director, is a lot to me about managing that creative tension, but above all, allowing it. And that can only happen in a context of trust. You try to do something which is not known before, you can only do it in a trust relationship. Trust between the people in the team. Trust between the different hierarchies in the company. Trust between you as a service uh, company and your clients sometimes. Because only in trust, I think, you feel confident enough to take risk. And without risk, of course, you never do something new. Making something new means stepping into a territory you don't know. It is, by definition, risky. But of course, then, we need to go to reality. We need to realize it. And then managing it, for me, is a kind of mixing of pulling and converging. It's pushing the uh, sometimes the engineers, but not only engineers, whole organization, to go beyond what they normally do. But also, and this is again extremely important, as designer, be conscious. Know your subject, know what you design, so you know where you have to go, where you can go, and not just be as a blind person walking alone in the desert. And when this happens, so, if everything goes well, that sometimes, not always, sometimes allows you at the end to slightly arrive above what we thought was possible before we started. And that's where I think we really have some innovation going on. So a lot, sometimes a lot of energy dedicated, a lot of force going on to create this small difference in the real world. I see concept cars in automotive bit like this. Big effort, people working day and night on making this one object. But that is often needed to make this small difference on the production car, which thousands of people then will use. And while I talk a bit now in kind of process way, I do want to underline it for me, it's always people that create and for me, processes tend to consolidate. And there's a lot of talking now about all the new instruments we have with internet and social design, about design is process, design by process. And I'm a huge fan of all the new opportunities we have of digital means, software, and so forth. But if you really look into it, into depth, for me, it's always the people that you'll create. And the process supports, helps, pushes, but also consolidates. So after the zooming out, this is where my passion lies, where this passion of the studio lies. It's, in a way, a passion to condense complexity. A car is hugely complex. Mobility questions are complex, but not only those subjects, into intuitive designs, designs that speak to people, communicate to people, touch them. And only then they can matter to them. You at least have the goal to make some small difference. I'm not saying we do it, that will be big, but I think it's a good goal to have as a designer. That we do see our profession as a way, as a potential to improve quality of life of people and societies. And this allows me to bridge to what at first hand may seem a totally different topic, which was mentioned before, which is the Biennale Interieur. 
Biennale Interior is a design biennale in Belgium. And in the previous edition, 2015, I was creating the Biennale. A lot of people asked me, what are you doing as the Ferrari designer with an interior Biennale? So I think I touched a bit upon the answer. To me, in essence, in depth, they have a lot in common. Also, a Biennale is a hugely complex subject. It's people involved. It's about what the people will experience when they get in contact with it. It's what they will do in it. It has also this mix of looking out for the commercial interests and balancing them with the cultural goals, which goes back for me to the core of design, finding that mix. And having grown up in an artist family, I quite for myself make this distinction quite strict. I see my brothers, my father, my grandfather at the time, they don't have to look for that balance. They don't have to make sure that the two match. I, as a designer, see it as my goal to do it, because if you want to make some change, I think it's important to try to that as much as people as possible can profit from that change, can experience it. So you have to balance the two elements. So when I was creating the Biennale, in a way seen afterwards, more than on forehand, it was sort of natural, logical that I think I worked almost more as designer of the Biennale than curator of the Biennale. Because I did it in the same way. I started with sketching, as you start with sketching from uh, a, a car, the first sketch in which you try to capture the character of what you want to have, but above all, you try to feel the connection, to imagine that future context of what you want people to experience in it, what you want them to, to feel. And that is, out of, that is what we worked out of. That was translated into uh, a scenario, a scene, where on the one hand, the Biennale is done in expo grounds, just at the edge of the city of uh, Kortrijk. But we also integrated a part in the center of the city because you want this experience to be full. You don't want just an experience when you step into an entrance and then everything finishes when you step outside in the evening. Because design is about presenting values. Companies that participate to the Biennale for me are, of course, they're presenting their products, but they're also present the values that those products uh, present. And as Biennale Inter, we want to offer the right context for those values, rather than being the logistics of a pure fair. And in a way, just like building computer models of, of uh, designs, we translate this into scenography. We connect it between the two with a, uh, a shuttle, which is an integral part of the design, uh, reflecting a bit my goal that in the future, when we move, the quality of mobility will not only depend on the quality of each vehicle, because that quality is becoming very high, very constant almost. The quality of our mobility experience will depend a lot on how we do the connection between different vehicles, the fluidity between those. And so a small tryout there in the Biennale connecting the expo grounds with the city center. And here are just some images to show that this is far beyond just a regular fair. It's a context where uh, people meet, where they can discover in the right setting, I believe, with the good public, uh, the design that the participants, the companies, the design brands have to offer. Creating a place where you want to be, creating a place that you would like to meet. Here are some small bar designs we did, which were mixed in the hall. So it's not separating business and then eating. It's just the whole thing uh, together. So those bars were mixed all over. The commercial participations were mixed with exhibitions. Again, my vision on design, the two connect. You don't have to separate them. It's not the museum on the one hand and a factory on the other. Two can connect. Installations that we commissioned here by the London design studio Troika, 
to bring in emotion, to bring in sensitivity, to bring in reset almost your experience because that is the condition that we want that the public then discovers also the projects of who participates. And of course, everything ends up with having a dinner in the bistro and all that connect here you see into one image that connected it whole. So again, the same philosophy. It's, it's a complexity, it's a layeredness that somehow you bring together into one thing. And the first experience you have, the first visual touch you have is coherent with what you live then after. I think that is, as I touched upon before, an important quality in the design is that if there's a layeredness, which can be the visual impression and later on the functional pleasure, that, th that those layers are coherent with each other. Because if a visual appearance of an object maybe can make you fall in love with it, after, I think, we should also have the goal that you actually develop a true relationship with it. And that can only, when it's layered and those layers speak, the same, give you the same as that initial promise. So the same approach I did when I was working with, as curator for the Biennale Interior. And uh, now in the meantime, I, uh, as was presented, I also, also became the president of the foundation that is organizing this uh, Biennale. And I think at that point, this is the right way to uh, salute you is by in a way, finishing this with an invitation to all come, or part, as participant, or as a visitor to the next Biennale, which will take place in October, 17, 26 October, in Belgium, in Kortrijk. And for all those who maybe after this week, hopefully got curiosity for all this, that, that small country, Belgium, all those things it has to offer, this can be maybe the next place where we'll for sure give an overview of all the great things that live, happen, and will continue to live in Belgium. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vimesh. Maybe you'd like to stay on stage, because I'm sure people will be dying okay. to ask you some Pleasure. questions. We're running a little bit late, so I think we have time for maybe just two questions. So please, please take the opportunity to ask a couple of questions. Yes, we have a gentleman over there. I'm John Lowe from the Hong Kong Design Center. With all the design that, uh, car design that I've seen, uh, I always ask this question, why don't they design a place where you can put tissue paper, <laughs> tissue box, but none so far? They always put it in the back parcel shelf in Hong Kong, I noticed, the cars. <laughs> um, the, the answer is um, not a lot of people ask the question. And, um, but uh, uh, above all, uh, often there's very little uh, space also in, uh, in a car. There are cars where a uh, tissue box will, will fix, but you will also have noticed that where you can see it like this. If you open the hood of a car 30 years ago, you open the hood and it's like an empty space where we see an engine sitting in. You know, and we, there's a lot of space around. Old cars even had uh, the spare tire there next to it. If you open a car today and you open the hood, it looks like somebody squeezed a lot of stuff inside. It almost looks like an artwork of Cesar. And that is also the case for the interior volumes. Everything is pushed, pushed to the maximum. Because if you think about it, of how much functionality you have in a car, it's in a way, I think, incredible. If you compare uh, what a car offers compared to regular furniture in the house with all the regulations, the air conditioning, the stuff, that has its cost. You know? And to make it practical, the tubes going to the back to make sure the back passenger has uh, air conditioning uh, often is taking away the space for the tissue box. So maybe we should talk with the passengers in the back. Yeah. And I sell tissue boxes too, by the way, at GAV. <laughs> okay, so the next question, please. Otherwise, I'm going to ask it. Oh, we have somebody way over there. Okay, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, 
talking to these people in the old business of cars, how do you manage to open their minds to this new scenario in the streets, talking about going beyond the car, about the environment, the interaction, maybe going beyond the, the old business to a new set of services and interactions? I think when you, when you talk with the people in, in, say, in the car manufacturers, so I'm also working in car business with outside manufacturers, I think you would be surprised how open-minded they are. There's, there's incredible people working in those uh, companies. Inside the companies, often there's very concrete scenarios existing which really look at future context, what we can do. But the question is not so much that people believing where we can go, but how we do the transition from where we are now to that point. You now we came, uh, uh, the way we use cars now have been extremely optimized around how we use them. But how do we transit from everybody using his car going to, uh, for example, sharing cars? And if you look in depth, if you look in internet, a lot of companies are really doing a lot of it. Audi has its urban future project. Uh, BMW has a huge sharing program in uh, mainly uh, German cities and rolling that out. So I think from that point of view, the impression from outside is uh, what's happening is much more innovative inside than maybe what you see uh, from outside. And it's about how getting from where we are now to going to that direction. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Thank Bermesh. You. And I just can't help noticing that it was a very beautiful presentation you did as well, the graphics oh, and everything. Thanks. I, I knew you took care on that. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Bye.